We've been so focused on the banking money deflationary stuff that every once in a while it's good to stop and remember there are two parts to our 2008 style scenario. The first part is obviously the deflationary money, the banking crisis, all that great stuff. The other part though, that's the weak economy. There's macro and money together. And when the two of those collide, that's where you get the worst cases. That's where you get the 2008 style scenario. Obviously, deflationary money, although it's not obvious to everybody, especially those who work at the Federal Reserve or the ECB or central banks around the world, it's not as obvious either with the macro stuff because there are still people out there who are talking about soft landings and not so many no landings anymore after the events of the past couple of weeks. So, But still, we have an economy that at the very least is in a pre-recession state or heading toward a recession. It might actually be in recession already, especially if these latest GDP numbers are to be believed. And we'll get to that. We've got... Both parts, we've got the crazy deflationary stuff. As I said yesterday, we've got collateral concerns, which continued again today. We've got crazy treasury bill auctions to remind us of the deflationary money. We've got GDP data, including some stark comparisons uh, that we need to go over to the, for the fourth quarter. Again, it's both parts of the 2008 style scenario, the money and the macro. That's what we'll get to next, but first, I'm Jeff. This is Euro Dollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're interested, I have Euro Dollar University memberships available where we get into the background details, the history, how it works, the plumbing behind the Euro Dollar system, which is actually the global's, global reserve currency, not the US dollar, the Euro Dollar. What does that mean? Find out with the Euro Dollar University membership. Research subscriptions, the daily briefing I do in partnerships with Markets Insider Pro, as well as a daily deep dive analysis. Let me say that again, deep dive analysis at Eurodollar University, where we dive deep into all of these things, money and macro, what they mean, how we got here, and what they're, what they're likely to mean going forward. All the information you need is at Eurodollar.University. Yesterday, we talked about collateral because collateral is such a huge part of the monetary equation. In fact, it is the monetary backbone of the modern system. And what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is continued aftershocks from the bottleneck earthquake. SVB, Credit Suisse, those are symptoms here. And as those are prominent symptoms, they're, the, uh, they're causing or they're leading to continuous reshuffling, the, you know, the lessons of Bear Stearns. Banks that are, not just banks, but financial participants around the world that are de-risking, building cash cushions, collateral cushions, which is what we've been talking about, uh, as well as hedging. The hedging continues even now. Curves are upside down. Euro dollar futures, we don't have the historic wild swings, but the curve went poom, and it hasn't come back. The yield curve is the same way. Um, so there's still massive amounts of hedging. But specifically with collateral, building a collateral cushion, leading to a systemic squeeze, because as banks hoard their own collateral or they don't reuse and repledge as much as they had before for various reasons, that leaves other parts of the system exposed to not having collateral, which then creates the situations like we saw yesterday and the day before, which were these scrambles for collateral or in some severe cases like a couple days ago really a run on collateral and that has continuous knock-on effects down the road so the stuff that happened in mid-march the stuff that's continuing even if it might seem as, the, as though there's less urgency to this crisis and makes it makes it seem like there isn't even a crisis it's still there under the surface if you know where to look and one of those places where you should look, as I said, treasury bill rates, because we don't have a whole lot of data on collateral as, as it is, but we're going to get some later today. Uh, repo fails, but that's last week. Unfortunately, it's uh, in arrears. But either way, we've got more treasury bill data for, from the auctions that happened just today. Last week, uh, as I said, both the four and eight week auctions, 0% equivalent yields on the lowest bids, which are the highest price bids, uh, for the second week in a row. That was last Thursday. Today, we got, again, new auctions. 
The Forig bi the Forig bill was actually somewhat more normal. Somewhat. When everything is always as is so far askew as it's been in the Treasury bill market collateral markets, um, even these results seem relatively benign, even though they're not. The high rate today was 460, which was much better than the 4.15 last week. Again, this is the four-week Treasury bill auction. The median of 4.4 was much better than 4% last week. Uh, and where last week we had a zero for a low rate, this week we have a 4% for a low rate. So not normal, but not certainly much better, much improved from last week, at least the four-week bill auction. These numbers, by the way, they're still well below the RRP, which as of today, which currently is 4.8%. So there's still huge demand, just not as sharp demand for four-week bills as last couple weeks. Eight-week bills, somewhat of a different story. The top end of the auction much, much better, but the top end now looks exactly like or very nearly like the four-week bill. So the high yield for the eight-week auction today was 4.6%, which is only modestly higher than the 4.4 last week. But that 4.6 for the high eight week is the same as the 4.6 for the high four week. The median was pretty much the same too. So if the four week median was 4.4, the eight week median is 4.45, which is only modestly higher than the 4.30 last week. Not as much improvement on the eight week bill. But here's the shocker. The low yield for the eight week bill was for, was 0% for the third week running. Zero for the eight week but not for the four-week. More demand for the eight-week bill than the four-week bill? That requires a little bit of thought here. So still some serious strain. And remember, the low yield isn't the absolute low yield. That's the at least 5% of the auction bids submitted were accepted at to, to price to that yield. Huge extreme prices at the far ends of these treasury bill auctions, which again suggests sustained collateral insufficiency shortages. Um, again, all of these yields way below the RRP. So even if it's better than the last couple of weeks, that's sort of a relative term. Better than awful is still not good. And that's what these numbers show us. So collateral wise, including the auctions, we're on the we're on the rebound, just like in late March of 2008. You saw the same thing. T-bill prices, T-bill yields eventually started to not quite normalize like they're doing now, but they were much better by the end of March than obviously in the middle and the immediate aftermath of Bear Stearns. Just like we're seeing now, Treasury bill prices are coming down a bit as yields are going back up, but they're not quite normalizing because... This is a sustained pressure, sustained demand, lack of supply for collateral. And by lack of supply, as I went over yesterday, I don't necessarily mean the Treasury Department, though that's a factor. It's really about the reuse, repledging, and rehypothecation, or the diminished reuse rate, the diminished repledging rate, and less rehypothecation than we would otherwise see under well, normal conditions, if that's really a term. So deflationary money, collateral, the auctions that happened today and the bills, still crazy stuff. Why is there more demand for the eight week than the four week? Something to think about as we move from the money part into the macro part. Because we always need to remember that this is there's two parts here, money and macro. The bad money, bad macro, put those together. If you've got bad money and really good macro, chances are things work out relatively fine. You've got really good money and bad macro. Maybe you just have a mild recession like 2001, but we don't have either of those. As we said, collateral, aftershocks, banking crisis, none of that stuff has gone away. Uh, today we got the GDP report, for the final estimate for the fourth quarter. So we're, even though we're going back into last year, there are a couple things here that are worth worth reminding us about the macroeconomic background as we head into the second quarter of 2023. Uh, the headline rate was 2.6%, down a touch from 2.7%, which was down from above 3% originally. Not really much change there. The revisions were mostly focused on consumer spending for reasons that will become clear. Um, consumer spending has become extremely weak Throughout the uh, throughout last year and heading into this year, as we know, that's that's what's triggered both the 
down leg of the inventory cycle, which is just getting started, as well as layoffs that we do see in the tech sector. Maybe layoffs are starting to come up, come into the picture too. And the reason would be is because consumer spending going down. Um, when you look at real personal consumption expenditures versus nominal personal consumption expenditures, the difference between nominal spending and real personal spending, you can see what's going on here. And it's not inflation, it's distortion. That's what happened in 2020 and 2021. The government came in, threw a bunch of borrowed treasury cash at the economy, and it led to a enormous eruption in spending, which, I mean, the treasury department will tell you that's what we wanted to happen. That's what the Federal Reserve wanted to happen. What they expected to happen from there was that spending would lead to more investment and more hiring, more redistribution of that money through productive channels in productive wealth building, sustainable fashion that would lead to a, a, permanent, a permanent increase in economic potential, economic conditions moving forward. That's certainly how many companies were viewing the 2020 and 2021 period as if they had achieved that, the government had achieved that, that they threw all this money that was gonna to lead to the virtuous cycle that we associate with sustained economic growth. But what instead happened was we threw all this money at especially consumers and businesses who spent it in the least productive manner possible. We bought goods, we locked in our houses, what did we do? We bought goods on amazon.com and so a big chunk of our spending went overseas. You know, the Chinese and everywhere, everybody else said, thank you very much for the business, as well as those dollars. We needed those trade dollars too. It's a double benefit for overseas, at least temporarily. But as that money went overseas, as we paid way too much for oil, we were not getting the other part of the recirculation effect, the redistribution. Companies, yes, they were hiring, they were paying more for workers, but not enough. They weren't hiring as many people as we needed them to. In fact, we're still well short of where the economy would have been had there not been a pandemic and recession in 2020. What that means is, as, we're, as in the aggregate, consumers are spending more nominally, less of it's coming back in the form of income. And certainly not enough income in the aggregate that consumers and businesses can keep up with all these price changes. So in real terms, you've got so we've got nominal terms, consumer spending is way up here. In real terms, spending is slowly fading because again, the Uncle Sam's uh, efforts and interventions are further, further in the past. At the same time, that lack of income is coming back to bite us. And so real spending, you can see starting to roll over. And when you look at it in terms of their baselines, Nominal spending well above their, the, the 2010s baseline. Real spending is actually now below the baseline and heading lower. Even nominal spending is starting to slow down. Let me throw some numbers at you. Quarter over quarter change in nominal personal consumption expenditures. In the fourth quarter, 1.2%, which is still relatively okay, but that's way down. I mean, 1.2% would be normal in, say, the, the 2010s period. 1.2% over the last couple of years, that's about half the rate that it was a couple of quarters ago. It was 2.3% in the second quarter of, nominal, again, this is nominal personal consumption expenditures, 2.3% in the second quarter of last year, 2.2% in the first quarter, 2.3% in the fourth quarter. So you see rising nominal spending at 2.3% quarterly rates suddenly begins to slow in the second half of last year. Nominal spending. So obviously real spending is going to slow down too, to the point that real PCE quarter over quarter at an annual rate in the fourth quarter was revised down to just 1%. This has left the overall economy in a very precarious position. Without consumer spending, keeping up with prices, without productive redistribution through incomes and job creation, real job creation, not this labor shortage nonsense, Labor shortage is just an excuse for the lack of job creation. Without that, the overall economy begins to slow down and suffer as well. And it's gotten so bad that to the point last year, remember the technical recession in the first half of last year? That wasn't actually a recession, but that was the beginning of this transition period. What everybody said was, Jay Powell and central bankers and politicians was, yeah, this is a good thing. We're gonna slow down from rapid growth to something more sustainable. 
when more and more it looks like we slowed down from a rebound from 2020, slowing down into what sure looks to be a recession. And how do we know it looks to be a recession? Well, first, the technical recession in the first part of the year. That's a pretty big clue that the slowdown was substantial. But when we look at the year-over-year changes or the calendar year changes, what you find is that because of the first half slowdown and then the second half didn't get any, there was really no acceleration in the second half, what that meant is on a calendar year basis, GDP last year grew by less than nine-tenths of a percent. On a fourth quarter to fourth quarter calendar year basis, which is how most we, how we measure them, that puts 2022 in the same range as, say, 2009 or 2001. Not as bad as 2008 or 2020, obviously, but nowhere near what had been normal for the 21st century, which normal in the 21st century isn't actually that good. I mean, it's less than 2011, which was 1.5%, less than 2012, which was 1.6%. That's less than 2007, which was 2.2%. So at 0.9%, it's actually 0.88%, we're closer to a recession type year last year than even a quasi normal year as in the 2000 or the 21st century. And it gets even worse when you look at it just year over year changes, not necessarily fourth quarter and go back all the way to the modern G, the start of the modern GDP data in the 1940s. So we got, well, uh, we've got almost 75 years of GDP data, year over year changes. What you'll see is that on, on only two occasions in 75 years. So what is that? Uh, 300 quarters twice. Only in two of them has GDP, the year-over-year rate, been less than 1%, and it didn't lead to recession in the near future. Those two occasions were in 2011, the third quarter of 2011, the year-over-year change got to 0.92% because QEs don't work like they tell you they do. And the other instance was Q3 1956, where GDP got down to 0.95%, didn't quite have a recession. We skip forward to one a little bit further down the road. So either this will be the third time this is this number has missed, or we are really heading toward a recession in the near term. Whether that means the first quarter or not, that's that remains to be seen, especially given the events in the first quarter. Because as even the Federal Reserve acknowledged, Jay Powell at his last press conference, this is a quote that I think will come back to haunt him repeatedly. We believe that events in the banking system over the past two weeks are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, which would in turn affect economic outcomes. You think? So we have the credit crunch that's coming. We have the fallout from the, Mar- the mid-March bottleneck madness. We've got deflationary money that the mid-March madness is a symptom of, as SVB and Credit Suisse are. And we've got a weak economy that looks to be, according to GDP, in a pre-recession, near-recession state to end the last year to begin with. We've got all of these pieces coming together, and Jay Powell says inflation is our greatest risk. Unbelievable. Instead, our biggest risk, our base case scenario is that 2008 style scenario. All the pieces are falling into place. The only thing missing right now is mass layoffs. And we'll get to those in in a future episode. Even though jobless claims are hovering around 190,000 weekly, there are other data points that suggest layoffs or at least um, unemployment is about to surge. You throw deflationary money and a credit crunch on top of a weak economy, I mean, there's not a whole lot of insight there anyway. I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, huge thank you to Eurodollar University members, as well as Eurodollar University and Markets Insider Pro research subscribers. I thank you very much for that. And until next time, take care.